Amen, amen. Thank you, Caitlin and our worship team for leading us this morning. If you have your Bible, I'd invite you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. To the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be starting a new series this morning, and we'll be studying Nehemiah through uh, the rest of this spring. So as you're turning there, there's just a couple things I wanted to share with you. And one of the first things is maybe you have noticed we stopped our Build and Pursue series. Um, We preached through that on Sunday mornings, but we're still studying it in our Bible study time. So know that what we're going to do is unpack those different markers of what does it mean to build and pursue? What does it mean to be uh, on a, to have biblical worship, biblical community, be on a biblical mission? And so the reason why we're doing all that and we're diving into it is it sometimes can be really hard to measure. How do we know that we are on the right track as a church? What is success, right? And many times what, when we try to look at metrics for success, what we start thinking about is, well, are there more people coming? Is there more money in the budget? You know, are there bigger buildings? Well, that means that God must be blessing, right? But we see throughout the Bible that you can't really distill spiritual formation into those simple, easy categories, right? And so what we want to do is we want to develop kind of our own categories, our own metrics, because we want to measure things here at the church. We want to make sure that we are growing. We want to see that we are forming more and more into the image of Christ and His Son. But with that being said, that's why we have all of these different um, metrics, all these different marks of biblical worship, of biblical community, of a biblical mission. And so that's why you'll notice during our Bible study time, throughout the entire month of February, we'll still be unpacking those markers. And those are metrics. Those are the measurements for us as a church to say, hey, Are we on the right track to doing what we feel like God has called us to do? So I challenge you, get plugged into those Bible studies. Understand that while we're diving into Nehemiah, which I think really goes um, just really well with this whole idea of building and pursuing, Nehemiah went to go build a wall, right? And really, more importantly, to rebuild the covenant between God and his people. But we'll still be unpacking those in Bible study. So I want you to still um, be a part of that and know that's why we're walking through that. And those are our markers. Those are our metrics. Those are the way that we are going to measure. Are we connecting with the Lord the way we want to as a church? So that was all free. It's not part of the message. Just want to encourage you. Be a part of the Bible study. But we're going to look at Nehemiah this morning. There's a couple things that we want to know. Just I'm going to give you a, a basic background, a brief overview before we really drive, dive into the message, okay? So this book was written around 424 to 400 BC, okay? And Nehemiah, who it's named after, he was a contemporary Ezra Malachi. And you kind of see this, I think this timeline is really helpful to know when it took place, okay? So Nehemiah really is one of the last books of the Old Testament. It's Nehemiah and then it's Malachi. So when you think about the timeline of the Old Testament, at about 400 B.C. or so, the canon of the Old Testament closes. We don't hear from God again until John the Baptist, okay? So that is the book of Malachi that ends it. But Malachi was a contemporary with Nehemiah, along with Ezra. And you see, everybody knows the, the story of Esther, right? So Artaxerxes, the king who Nehemiah is the cupbearer for, Esther was his stepmother, okay? So that maybe helps us contextualize when is Nehemiah taking place? What's going on? So you kind of see on hopefully this helpful timeline when we're talking about what time period that we're talking about. And just a little bit about the book itself. The book was really originally connected with Ezra. So it was um, called, if you look at the Latin Vulgate, it's actually called Second Ezra. So the book of Nehemiah is based on the journals of Nehemiah, but what many scholars believe is that while Nehemiah wrote these journals, an editor, most likely Ezra, compiled those journals together and wrote some of his own editorial remarks. And so we could say almost like a dual authorship of Nehemiah and Ezra in the book of Nehemiah. So it's under it's helpful to understand those things. So Nehemiah, let's give a brief overview. Again, written 424 to 400, one of the last books written, contemporary of Ezra and of Malachi. And 
what this book is about and really give you an idea of Nehemiah. He is the cupbearer of the king of Persia. So he's a cupbearer of the king of Persia. And what he did is he led the third wave of exiles returning to Jerusalem in 445 BC. So what happened is you had the Babylonians that came in and they wiped out Jerusalem. Okay, this was punishment that God delivered because of the Israelites' sin. Then you have people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, right, who all get taken back to Babylon. There, after 70 years, we have a change. It's no longer the Babylonian Empire. The Persians come in and destroy the Babylonians. They take over. And then we have, after 70 years, you have Zerubbabel, who leads the first group of Israelite exiles back in 538 BC. Then you have Ezra, who brings the second group of exiles in 458 BC. And then finally, when we come onto the scene right now in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is about to lead the third group of exiles in 445 BC. Sounds exciting, right? So that's where we're at. That's a little bit of our background. And what this book focuses on is it focuses on rebuilding Jerusalem's walls and renewing God's covenant. And there's a key theme throughout it. And the key theme of this book is prayer. Prayer is a focal point throughout the book, and we'll see it time and time again. So why do we study this book? There's great leadership lessons from Nehemiah. There's a great focus on prayer. And overall, you know, as we've called this series, The God Who Builds. In the book of Psalms, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, the workers labor in vain. So we want to make sure everything that we are doing in our lives through this church is that we are letting God be the one that builds it. So with that being said, I'd love for you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. My friend Jim is going to read Nehemiah chapter 1 for us this morning. The words of Nehemiah, son of Halakiah. During the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. They said to me, the remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of the heavens. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly toward you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances that you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to a place where I chose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeemed them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. At the time, I was the king's cupbearer. Let's go to Lord in prayer. God, we love you. We're thankful for your word. God, we pray that you'd speak to us this morning through your word. God, I pray that our hearts would also be broken for our city. God, we pray that you'd make us aware of the needs that are around us. And God, we pray that just for the next few moments, you'd turn our mind's attention and our heart's affection to you and your word. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, 
And then, Nehemiah is heartbroken when he hears about Jerusalem. He, at some point in time, gotten pretty comfortable in his job, gotten pretty comfortable there in Persia, in Susa, and he hadn't really thought much about what was going on, but God breaks his heart and softens his heart to the state of Jerusalem. Now, we're gonna throw a picture up there, and this is a, this is a fun picture. I'm gonna tell you a fun story, okay? There, there's gonna be fun context, okay? That is a needle in my knee, okay? Isn't that nice? Yeah, so here's, here's what happened. Maybe you can kind of see the scar. When I was like, I don't know, 11 years old or something like that, I was playing baseball, I slid into a metal sprinkler. Okay, that sprinkler sliced open my knee. It caused a whole lot of damage. I got 36 stitches, okay? And part of the damage that it caused, it caused some nerve damage. And so I realized when I was in junior high, as my trick to impress the ladies, I would get a thumbtack and I could stick it into my knee. And there was no pain. I was telling Jill this story. I said, I'm talking about, you know, how we can become numb to the needs around us. I was like, I was, I was thinking about my knee and how I used to do this. She was like, you really did that? I was like, I was in junior high, right? It's all context matters. But I thought it was cool and I thought the ladies would like it, okay? If I stuck needles into my, so I tried this week again. And so, so the, you know, I'm still numb. I will say, when I push in a little bit farther, it's like, oh, okay, maybe some nerves start working again. I think I'll leave it right there, okay? But here's the point. Should we be able to stab ourselves and not feel pain? No. Is that natural? No. Is it advisable? No. We feel pain for a reason. It's your body letting you know something is not right. Pain is actually a good thing. It tells you things aren't the way they're supposed to be. But my nerves were damaged, so I didn't feel what I was supposed to feel. So I'd stick thumbtacks in my knee. Sorry, Mom, okay? My parents are here. They're like, well, you know, you've done worse. So, <laughs> But here's the deal. I thank God all the time that I was born in this country. Aren't you thankful to be born in America? I mean, we are so incredibly blessed to be born where we are, to be born when, in this certain time frame. I mean, it is remarkable. You compare our country to the rest of the world and we are blessed beyond belief. It's amazing. You know, just to contrast a little bit, my older brother lives in China. If you know anything going on, you know, the coronavirus, everything like that, the Chinese government has just, you know, they've said, we're shutting down all public places, we're shutting down all schools, you will stay in your buildings, you're not going anywhere, we'll, we'll shut down all our borders. And then he said, here's the deal. I was like, you know, are you worried, this virus, everything like that? He goes, well, he said, sometimes China being a big brother, he said, they have watched all the cameras. Anyone that travels to that Wuhan province, they are taking them and putting them into quarantine. They're not getting a choice, right? Because China is watching everything that their citizens do. My older, um, my older brother, his wife, and my niece, who I still haven't met, were supposed to come here to St. Louis last summer. The Chinese government just decided you know what, no, no on the visa, okay? And they can just do that. There's not the same types of freedom there in China that we have here. This is the land of the free, right? We should be thankful for that. However, conversely, because we are so blessed, because we have so many things. Sometimes it can be very, very easy for each and every one of us to become numb to the needs around us because life is comfortable. Let me just ask you, have we become comfortably numb to brokenness? Have we become comfortably numb 
to brokenness. Just like with my knee, that's not natural. Are you aware of the needs that are around us? Nehemiah's heart was broken over the state of Jerusalem. Let's give a little background on what Nehemiah is. Nehemiah has a pretty good gig. Remember, originally the Israelites were taken as slaves to the Babylonian kingdom. Nehemiah is born probably in Susa, in that area. He's descended from slaves there in Persia, and yet he gets a pretty sweet gig. What's his gig? He's the king's cupbearer. Now, understand this, it can be dangerous, right? Because what does the cupbearer do? You sample the wine before it's given to the king because if someone's going to poison the king, well, if you get sick and die, the king knows I don't drink that, okay? So there's a dangerous aspect to Nehemiah's job. However, you have to understand a little bit of context. This king he's serving, Artaxerxes, at this moment in time, he's in year 19 of a 41-year reign as king of Persia. His kingdom is in control. All right, he is, he's got it all under control. He is the mightiest ruler in the world at the time. And no one's really messing with him. As part of Nehemiah's job, most scholars believe, is he traveled all around the ancient Near East to find the best vineyards and the best wines, which he would then sample and say, okay, that's good enough for the king. Let's bring it back to him. Nehemiah had a pretty cush job and a pretty nice deal, especially for being descendants from, descending from a slave, right? He's got all this stuff going for him, and yet something happens. It says that he hears from Hanani, one of his brothers. He says, what's happening back in Jerusalem? And what do they say to him? The remnant in the province who also, who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's walls have been broken down and its gates have been burned. Nehemiah's heart is pricked and it's broken over the state of Jerusalem. And this is what we're understanding. Now, no, ancient Near East, Jerusalem was where the temple to the Lord was, right? This city represents God to the nations. When the walls are broken down, when the gates are all burned, when the city is sieged, what that's telling all the pagan nations around Israel, they're saying that God is not strong enough to defend his city. Now, we understand from our perspective studying, why did God allow that to happen? Because of Israel's sin, right? There was punishment that happened. Israel had sinned, so God punishes Israel. They're taken off to captivity to 70 years. Well, then Zerubbabel heads back, brings the first remnant. And then we see Ezra goes back again. And Nehemiah obviously knew about these types of things. It had been about 14 years since Ezra had taken it back. And then he's like, how are things going? They're like, it's still terrible. The walls are destroyed. There's disgrace. The gates have been burned. So though the siege of Jerusalem had happened 141 years earlier, the walls of the city had not been rebuilt. And here's the deal. We understand if you go back to Ezra chapter 4, do you know why the walls haven't been rebuilt? The walls haven't been rebuilt because his king, Artaxerxes, said, you know what? We're not going to allow the Israelites to rebuild their walls. So the king that he's about to go see, right? The next chapter, we know he goes to the king. That king was the one who said, you cannot rebuild the walls. He wanted to keep his thumb on the Israelites, make sure they didn't get too strong. So they have not been built, they have not been rebuilt based on the decree of Nehemiah's boss, King Artaxerxes. So Nehemiah hears about all this, and his heart is broken. So let me just ask you this question. As we think about our cities, we think about St. Louis. When is the last time that you've been heartbroken 
over the spiritual state of our city. When's the last time you've been heartbroken over the spiritual state of our city? I've been doing some research in preparation for this. I wanna share a few stats about our city, okay? When you talk about the entirety of St. Louis, only 20% of people claim to be evangelical Protestants. So what I mean by that is, you can read the stats and they'll say, you go to pre research and they're like, oh, 70% of people in St. Louis claim to be Christian. Well, you start to break that down and we see, well, 25% are Catholic, but then only 20% are evangelical Protestant. That means believe the Bible, all right? Believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. Believe that you have to be born again, all right, to have eternal life. Only 20% of our city believe that. That's it. 21% of people in St. Louis claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. They're called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Whether you're atheist, agnostic, or just ambivalent, 21% of people in our city claim zero religious affiliation. So you get that right. There are more people who claim no God than there are people who believe in the Jesus of the Bible. That should make us think a little bit, right? In our city, this is interesting, only 34% of people believe in clear standards for right and wrong. This is all from Pew Research Center data. Only 34% believe in clear standards for right and wrong. 64% of people believe that right or wrong depends on the situation. Two-thirds of people in our city believe that there is no objective standard for truth. Do you see how postmodernism has really just enveloped the minds of our people? This idea that truth is relative, that you can determine your own truth? We live in a post Christian culture, don't we? And what we're told now by society is just trust your feelings more than trusting facts, right? Believe whatever you want, embrace your own truth. Well, there is one problem with that. We have a clear standard for truth, don't we? And since we have a clear standard for truth, we must be willing to say no matter the situation that God's truth is timeless. Unfortunately, two-thirds of our city do not believe the same. In our city, you've probably heard this before, and I've heard how the, they're, they're skewed, but if you just talk about just the city of St. Louis, not the entire county, just the city of St. Louis, we're number one in the nation in murders, 61 murders per, per 100,000 people. Now, I hear, everybody says, well, that's, 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 that doesn't really count St. Louis County, right? So if you so if you step back and say, it have the entire metropolitan area, that's three million people, that number drops to 13 murders per 100,000 people. And instead of being number one in the country, we're number four. Really a lot of improvement, right? We're tied with Detroit. Yeah, 13 murders per 100,000 people. You can read these statistics about our country, and I think there's one conclusion that we can all come to, and you know what that is? Our city needs Jesus. Our city needs Jesus. But when's the last time? I was convicted of this myself, that I've been heartbroken over the spiritual state of our city. There's a lot of different churches in St. Louis, but it's hard to look at those stats and not think that darkness is winning. My prayer is that we would see a third great awakening in our lifetime. 
And I think that St. Louis is strategically located. Think about the arch, right? The gateway to the west, right? We're right here in the center of America. How strategic would it be for revival and a great awakening to spring up here in our city? But when's the last time that we've prayed for our city, prayed for revival, prayed for God to do what only God can do? 21% of people with no religious affiliation whatsoever. We need the Lord to work. Nehemiah feels the same way about his city, about Jerusalem. His heart is broken. And so what does he do? He seeks after the Lord. I think this is interesting. You know what Nehemiah's name means? When you, when you study scripture, especially in the Old Testament, specifically in the Old Testament, when these characters come on, it's really good. You get a lot of insight into the story and the narrative when you just figure out what does their name mean. And Nehemiah's name means Yahweh comforts. Yahweh comforts. This is a reminder that God is with us in the midst of our difficult circumstances and he wants to bring about restoration. God wants to bring about restoration because God comforts and God has chosen to use you and me as his ambassadors. That we are, we're agents of reconciliation and we're agents of comfort who step into a broken world and offer the comfort that only the gospel can bring. And Nehemiah hears these things, verse four. He sits down and what does he do? He weeps, he mourns, he fasts, he prays. Nehemiah's response to the problem is to weep, to fast, and to pray. So as we hear about these stats of our city, we need to seek God's face in prayer. Nehemiah weeps, he fasts, he prays. We understand from this, this is three to four months that Nehemiah spends weeping, fasting, praying. And there are four main components of his prayer. He says, Lord, the God of the heavens, great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. First, we see adoration of God and his character. When Nehemiah hears about what happened to Jerusalem, he does not blame God. He knows God is good, right? In the midst of difficult circumstances, God is good, and God is sovereign. He understands, so he offers first adoration of who God is. And then look what he does, he transitions. And he says this, I confess the sins we've committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We've acted corruptly towards you. We have not kept the commands, the statutes, and the ordinances you gave. So the second thing is we see confession of sin, both personal and communal. You know, we're such an individualistic society that we like to blame any of our issues on someone else. It's my parents' fault. It was the school's fault. It was the coach's fault. It was my brother's fault. It was my friend's fault. And Nehemiah says, God, not only do I know it's my fault, but it's my fault, it's my family's fault, it's all of us as a nation of Israel, it is our fault because we have not been following you the way that we should. So we can read these statistics and we can blame secular media and we can blame post-Christian culture or what we can do is we can look right back at the church and say, we have not been on mission the way we need to be on mission. God, we confess that we have not done enough. We confess our sins. Then what does he do? Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you return to me, carefully observe my commands. Even though your exiles are banished, I will gather them from where they are and bring them to the place where I choose. He recites scripture and God's promises. He recites scripture, he recites God's promises. When things seem bleak, we stand firm on God's promises. He has never failed, right? God has never failed. 
He's never broken a promise. We know ultimately Christ is going to return and we're going to win, right? This is good news. So in the midst of difficulty, we stand firm on God's promises. You know, it's really interesting. When you look at the entire world, do you know where the church is growing the most? Two countries, China and Iran. To the darkest places in the world, and that's where the church is growing because God is faithful. And we know one day, someone from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be before the throne. So we claim God's promises. We stand firm on God's promises. One thing I love about this church is our history and our heritage, founded in 1807. 213 years of God's faithfulness. And then Nehemiah recognizes a few things. Look at what it says. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today. Grant him compassion in the presence of this man. So first, please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer. We delight and revere in your name. Verse 10, you redeem them by your great power and your strong hand. So first we recognize that God is sovereign. There's a recognition that God is sovereign. He is in control. He is mighty to save. So he recognizes that he gives glory and honor to God. Then, you know what else he says? Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. He says, I'm going to go to the king, God. I'm going to ask him to reverse his foreign policy of the last 13 years. I need you to help me out. He says, because I am going to get involved. Nehemiah doesn't just pray for his city to improve. He prays and he says he's going to do something about it. I love William Carey father of modern missions. And he said this, he said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God, but attempt great things for God. In other words, we're not just gonna pray for revival, but we're gonna step out and we're gonna act in faith that God will move. And finally, we see that Nehemiah recognizes he's not alone. He has co-laborers. He says, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Nehemiah understands he's not in it alone. Can I just say, say I'm just so thankful for each and every one of you for co-laborers in the mission that we have here at Fifi Baptist, for the prayer warriors here at Fifi. I can't tell you the number of times where maybe I'm just going through a day or a week of discouragement. I'll just have someone randomly, you know, Zach, we pray for you and your family every day. Zach, we're praying for you and for the church. Zach, we're praying that God will do something in and through Fifi Baptist. We're not alone. We can unite together. And Nehemiah recognizes that. He's saying we're better together. So ultimately, as we look at this passage, what do we need to do? First, we need to pray for our city. Pray for our city. Get involved in our prayer warriors ministry. Come down to the altar and pray. Be a part of our Wednesday night prayer meeting, our Saturday morning men's prayer and Bible study. There's lots of opportunities for us to pray. Pray for our city, and also be willing to pursue its good. You know, our church is already doing a lot. We work with loaves and fishes, the homeless ministry. We have a backpack ministry where we provide food for kids, underprivileged, so they can have food to make it through a weekend. We're hosting women and kids from Room at the Inn, the homeless shelter. Six times a year, we're gonna have them come and stay in our gym, and we're gonna feed them and minister to them. Every Monday night, we have 
guys come in from the community for basketball that we can minister to. We have ESL classes Tuesdays and Thursdays. We have Meals on Wheels. We have so much going on. You know, Friday night we had just this little fun family activity. We call it Family Nerf Games. Invited people from the community. We had over 100 people here to shoot each other with Nerf guns on Friday nights. And over half of those were visitors who don't normally attend this church. We pray for our city and we pursue its good. Look for ways to get involved because ultimately here's the truth. Jesus came and paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. And through Christ, we can now offer the hope of the gospel to a broken world. And so when we step out in faith, we're not stepping out in our own strength or in our own might. The Bible says that God will fill us with his spirit. And when we step out in faith, we're stepping out as spirit-filled believers on mission for God. What can we do if we're willing to not only pray for our city, but be willing to pursue its good? Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're thankful for your word. Lord, we're thankful for the book of Nehemiah. Lord, how we see so many correlations between Jerusalem and St. Louis. God, we pray that you would use us, Lord, to be agents of comfort like Nehemiah, to be agents of reconciliation, to be agents of change in our city. God, we pray for revival to spring up from the ground, and we pray that it would start here with us. God, we pray expecting you to do great things. But God, I also pray that we'd be willing to attempt great things on your behalf. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, and the hope that we have in him. It's his name we pray, amen.